As I mentioned earlier, today we are celebrating All Saints Day. Do you all know about All Saints Day? I mean, we've celebrated it before. I mean, we've done it at least every year since I've been the pastor here, and I assume for several many years before I got here. But why All Saints Day? Why do we make, make such a big deal out of this day? How did we even get this holy day in the first place? Well, it all comes down to martyrs. Well, first, okay, before we talk about martyrs, we need to set a distinction here. So there's, there are two churches. There is the church militant, and that is us, the church here on this earth to do God's will. We're the ones that are doing stuff, and that's why we get called the church militant. Then there's the church triumphant. They're the ones who are done with their doing stuff and are now at the throne of God. So church militant, church triumphant. We are militant and doing stuff. They are triumphant because they've done stuff and now they have achieved victory in Christ. Straightforward enough, right? So there are any number of ways that someone can go from the church militant to the church triumphant. But in the early church especially, there was one particular way of getting into the church triumphant that was considered more special, and that was to die as a martyr. To die because of your faith in Jesus. Early on in the church, when Christians were under a good deal of persecution, holding firm to your faith was an important thing, and it was something to be celebrated among the other local churches. So if your church had someone who died under persecution, they were honored, especially in your church. Stands to reason, right? Because they were an example of how to stand firm in faith, even though people are trying to kill them for it. So a Christian, for example, that was martyred in Syria would be honored in a church in Syria. However, churches talked. You know how churches are. Churches always talk, right? And after a while, a church in, say, Turkey might hear about a martyr from Syria and say, oh, that's kind of cool. Let's honor him too. And so they started to kind of mix together all these different martyrs and that's how the Western church ended up with so many saints' days. Because every time there was a martyr, they were honored as a saint, and it started to be honored in a whole bunch of churches. And after a while, they kind of went, we have a lot of saints' days, and I'm sure there's some martyrs that we're not celebrating, so let's create a day for everybody. And so it was decided eventually uh, after trying a couple different dates, that the first day of November would be the day to celebrate the Holy Apostles, All Saints, Martyrs, and Confessors. All Saints Day. So All Saints Day was meant to celebrate those in the church triumphant who died specifically because of their faith in Jesus. But there arose another day that was called All Souls Day, that was meant to celebrate, well, all of those who have died faithful to Jesus. To put it more clearly, All Saints Day was a holy day to honor all the saints and martyrs, both known and unknown, but All Souls Day focuses on honoring all faithful Christians who are unknown in the wider fellowship of the church, especially family and friends. So for a long time, these were two separate days. November 1st was All Saints Day. November 2nd was All Souls Day. But after a while, and especially in Protestant churches, the two days kind of blended together. And so today, All Saints Day is less about creating a distinction between those who have died because of their faith and those who have died having faith. And now it's just all about celebrating those who are now the church triumphant. Now, if you're anything like me, the next question you want to ask is, 
okay, the church triumphant is with Jesus. What are they doing? What is the church triumphant up to right now? And before we get into that, I have to ask all y'all a question. Do you like church? I hope you do. Because if you didn't like church, you would be in trouble in eternity. Because there are two things that happen in church. Or in, the etern- in eternity. They have church and they have feasts. That's eternity. It's like a fifth Sunday potluck all the time. Because that's what the kingdom of God is all about. They worship God and they eat. Doesn't that sound wonderful? To worship God and eat? And eat really good stuff too, but that's neither here nor there. So why do I think that eternity with Jesus is all about church and feasts? Well, in the book of Ezekiel at the very end, there's this picture of a perfect temple. The temple, of course, is where the people of Israel would go to worship God. And the image of this temple is so perfect that it can't be realized in any other way than the eternal kingdom of God. And the image of a temple that Ezekiel creates at the end of that book looks a lot like a picture of the holy city of God at the end of the book of Revelation. It's massive beyond comprehension. Well, okay, the temple's not quite so massive beyond comprehension, but the eternal city of God is definitely massive beyond comprehension. And out of the temple and out of the city of God flows a river of the water of life. And then when you get through the entire book of Revelation, it is full of people singing and praising God. Living creatures and elders sing, angels sing, every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth sings, a faithful multitude sings, Elders and living creatures sing again. The elders keep singing. Angels sing some more. Then an even greater multitude sings. And that's just the one I found by flipping through real quick. There's probably even more. There's a lot of singing in the heavenly kingdom of God. They're all worshiping Jesus. But then again, heaven is also described as a wedding feast. Now, When we have weddings and we have wedding receptions, generally, you're going to get, like, finger food or sandwiches these days. Most people don't do, like, a full sit-down wedding dinner anymore because caterers are expensive. Let's all be honest here. But back in the day, in Jesus' time especially, wedding feasts were not just you go to the wedding, you sit at the reception for an hour and have some food, and then there's dancing. We're talking a three-day affair for these wedding feasts. These are big deals. You have, so um, several years ago when my aunt got married, um, their wedding was a weekend extravaganza. Like Friday was a clam bake, and then Friday night was another dinner, and then Saturday was the wedding, and there was a big dinner after that. It was an event. And that's how these weddings were in Jesus' time. It wasn't just something you can go to in an afternoon. It was an event. And this is what the heavenly kingdom is described as. It is a wedding feast. Jesus describes it that way. It's described that way in Revelation chapter 10, I think. And it's better than any feast that we can imagine here on earth. Because in this feast, we also know that as we read in Revelation 21, there is no more death, there's no more mourning, there's no more crying, no more pain, because all of that has gone. That's what the church triumphant's up to. And it sounds pretty fun, because I kind of like church, and I really like to eat. It sounds great. But what does that mean for us? What does that mean for us, the church militant, who's still here awaiting the fulfillment of that promise that God made for us? Well, God leaves us with little tastes of eternity. He leaves us with things that tie us together to this church triumphant. 
One of the big ones is when we are gathering together to sing and worship to God, we are joining with that great chorus in heaven. We are singing along with them. A lot of the songs that we sing during the church service sound a lot like the stuff that people are singing in the book of Revelation. We sing things like, holy, holy, holy. We sing things like, worthy is the lamb who was slain. In the same way, when we come up for the Lord's Supper, it's a taste of that eternal feast. When we come to his table, we are joining in with the great table where all of the saints are gathered together. And so we have these tastes, these reminders that in Jesus, there is a resurrection. In Jesus, there is life. And when we have our church here, when we have our meager feast here, we are tied together with those whom we love, who are already enjoying eternal worship of God and eternal feasting with God. We become and we get these little reminders of all of God's people and all of God's church coming together, both the church militant and the church triumphant. Because in God, we know that we will join that church triumphant someday. That we will see eternal church and eternal feast. And we will take part with all of the faithful Christians who have gone before us. Both those we know and those that we have never met. And it will be the greatest church service you've ever been to. Followed up by the greatest feast, greater than you can ever imagine.